At the UCLA, I make new E. coli that can make uh, advanced biofuels. Like not just ethanol, they can make a very long chain alcohols that can have much higher energy density. Or I make some non natural amino acids. They can be the building blocks of uh, some blockbuster drugs. So that's a big challenge in the biodegradable industry how to make something that is elastic and flexible so you can make so you can use them for different applications that's how i came up with this kind of solution to make a new material that is biodegradable that is biodegradable that is scalable for commercial production i think in this modern age the most important thing is how can you combine all different knowledge to come up with new solutions, new devices, new thoughts that a computer cannot do, that anyone else cannot do? It's called personality. You should be your own. And your own may be able to change the world, nothing else. From my own experience, we need to love the planet, planet just like we love our family. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful Westlake University in Hangzhou, China. We are now going to be talking about sustainable industrialization and circular economics. We have Dr. Ketchen Zhang joining us on the show. Hi, Ketchen. Thanks, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Really appreciate it. I'm so excited for this conversation. For those who don't know Ketchen's background, he's professor and PI at the School of Engineering at Westlake University, focused on designing greener chemical production processes and new environmentally friendly materials for a more sustainable path to industrialization and circular economics. He is the inventor of scalable sugar-based biodegradable rubber, and you can find the links in the bio below. Ketchen, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions we like asking our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? So we have 8 billion people right now on Earth. We are going to have 9, 10, 11 billion people very soon, maybe in just one decade or two decades. How can we find enough food, chemicals, materials to supply to so many people? In the same time, keep our environment intact. That's a big challenge in Everywhere, in everywhere of the world. Yeah, how can we sustainably meet the basic requirements of living for a growing population of people that want to live more and more in a developed, industrialized way? And we need green technology, sustainable solutions for um, these processes. And I like how you put this. You put this as industrializing but doing it in a more sustainable way i like that i like that focus of yours okay let's talk about we'll get more into this as we continue the show let's talk about your journey and how you even got to become who you are today how did you get interested in science when you were young actually my father was a geologist so he gave me a name of my name is kachun in chinese it means the spring of science the spirit? The spring. The spring of science. Yes. Yeah. And then I was born I was born on the Earth Day, April twenty second. So nice. so it's like a good journey from the beginning. Yeah. And then my when I was a kid, uh, we moved around China. So I appreciate the beauty of nature. So I would like to keep the nature as beautiful as it is all the time. But in the past uh, four decades, you can see 
China has experienced a big change. The economy is growing. In the same time, the environment, the environment has big issues. So we make more and more chemicals. We make more and more cars. So we can see air pollution. People need to wear uh, masks in Beijing or Shanghai, all those big cities. And our cars on the street emit so much smoke every day. So this, some people like this kind of uh, modern lifestyle, but for many people, it could be a big uh, torture, actually. A health hazard. Yes. And a hazard for nature as well. We're choking the area that we live in for the clean air. We're choking it with our landfills, with our garbage. Not circular economics. Yes. Yeah. So both father was geologist. My, my, my father. Was geologist. A geologist, yeah. And then you were born on Earth Day. Yes. Too. Cool. And the and it was in Beihai. Uh, near Beihai, yeah. Near Beihai. Yeah. Near Beihai, which is uh, on the very south coast of of China. Yes. And uh, it's kind of like you were saying, like a very like Hawaii of the east. Eastern Hawaii. Yeah. yeah, Eastern Hawaii. I like that. And then you were also teaching me. Did you end up living in Gulin? Uh, did you live I, there at all? I, I was. I was always moving from one place to one place. You were place. always moving? Yes. Interesting. When you were young, always moving. Even, yeah. So I never stayed in one place more than nine years. <laughs> so Did you live in Gulin at all? Uh, just very short time. So very not short a, time. Not a, yeah. And this is known as uh, one of the most beautiful destinations of the Eastern Hemisphere, along with uh, Hangzhou, but um, where we're at now. but. Um, and for those that don't know, it's G-U-I-L-I-N. And look it up. It's just gorgeous. Um, Bill Clinton visited there. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I got to go. I, it looks so amazing. Um, I, lo- I really appreciate you teaching me about that. And even Beihai, too. This, these are really important places to go to. People just think of the major cities when they think of China. And so I think it's really important to share these gems in these other locations in China. Also, it, that's why nature is so important to me. I have seen all these beautiful places. I appreciate the beauty of nature. So, Yeah. When you see the beauty of um, Gulin or of uh, Yosemite, like in California, um, you become more aware of the importance of preserving these beautiful natural sites of the planet uh, and not just saying uh, yeah let the industry come in and cut down all the trees and and put hotels up everywhere and uh, yeah it's, uh, it's very important but we, in the same time we are human beings we love to drive we love to fly so we cannot abandon our modern lifestyle <laughs> yes this is a very important point too so Okay, so we figure out how to advance our modern lifestyle in a sustainable path of industrialization. And then that makes it so that all of our travel is cleaner, all of our food is cleaner, all of an agriculture is cleaner, all of our chemicals are cleaner. We're going to talk about this. So you ended up going to um, the University of Science and Technology in China um, for uh, polymer science and engineering. And um, how did you end up like picking that as what you were interested in? That's very specific, polymer science. Polymer being long chains of carbon. Yes, because um, I love chemistry, but in the same time, I want to use chemistry to make some things. So polymer ends up to be a good target. So if you watch a movie, one of the most one one of the most famous movies like graduate so the, you watch the end where should you go plastics yeah 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 it's interesting so you were teaching me that um polymers are the third largest uh, manufacturing industry in the united states yes 
Yeah, that's that's huge. Okay, and um, and the top ten uh, polymers that we use are non biodegradable. In the world, the top ten in the world are non biodegradable and chemically synthesized. And chemically synthesized. Okay, and uh, um, and we'll we'll get to um, explaining this a little bit more too. But the the names of them are polyethylene and poly. Propylene. And PET, like for the Coca Cola bottles, is PET. PET. Yeah, interesting. For like Coca Cola bottles, um, uh, all of the packaging uh, around those little thin film plastic yes. packaging around our goods. Or the iPhone top. iPhone top. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, polymers are a massive industry and figuring out how to. Um, Prioritize making them biodegradable is very important, um, but not abandoning the modern lifestyle, like you were indicating too, but sustaining our beautiful nature. So, okay, so then from there, it was um, doing your PhD at actually California Institute of Technology. So, studying biomaterials and doing the PhD in chemistry. So, this Tell, teach us about this move. How did you decide to make the move to the United States for the PhD? And what was it first like when you got into the culture? Uh, U.S. Has, has been the center of science for, for a long, long time. And I believe it will continue so. So I think uh, pursuing a PhD in U.S. can provide me more opportunities. That's one thing. Another thing is, uh, I can experience more different cultures. I think the diversity is important, either for education, for science, or for our own uh, personality. That's why I made the move. And Caltech has been a great place for science and engineering, and. It's near Hollywood. You can find anything in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Why not? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like your focus on um, visiting other parts of the world that have a strong uh, scientific advancement um, happening. That's why we're here in China as one of the reasons. Like We want to come to a place in the world that has a very serious scientific advancement happening and we want to interview the leaders in those fields and then share that with the world and uh, the usa is a very mixing pot of cultures so you got to immerse yourself in a very deep diversity of cultures when you were in the us in la and when i come to china i get to immerse myself in the diversity of china a chinese culture even though it's more homogenized only chinese mostly here but still i get a completely different um, cultural vibe being here and i think that's really important for trying to bring the world closer together so you doing your phd in caltech me coming here for interviews and stuff these types of moves are very important for especially young people to do uh, their interchange, early years. yeah, yeah, to interchange and meet the cultures of people, make friends in the different parts of the world. Then all of the media stuff, it seems like it doesn't matter because I I have friends. I know that we have love and friendship and collaboration across the countries, and the media is just selling me fear and other nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if so if you look at the most from my own perspective, if you look at the most two important inventions in China, I believe is the paper and printing. Because it allow they allow the spread of knowledge everywhere. M most people when they think about the invention of paper and the printing press to spread ideas and knowledge around the world. I think they think of the printing press and Johannes Gutenberg um, in the early 1400s. And, and then also even prior to that, we using uh, papyrus um, and other uh, uh, like animal skins uh, to be able to write on and then you know, not so easily being able to like erase and having to like write over things and all this type of stuff. 
when was the paper and the and the uh, the paper and printing and printing was in originally developed in China maybe year? maybe two to three thousand years ago. I don't exactly remember the yeah. date. Interesting. And even prior to that, we had all of the the art um, cave uh, paintings. I believe those were like tens of thousands of of years ago. So, and this leads us up to all the way up to you were saying that the internet um, for the spread of ideas. Yes, and then for example, I went to Caltech. Uh, actually, Caltech people like Bill Shockley and Gordon Moore, they got their PhD or bachelor degree in, at Caltech, and then they invented a semiconductor industry, and then it led to the internet, and then we can talk, and then other parts of the world can listen. So that's amazing. From paper to internet, now exchange of ideas can be instant. Yes. It does not take days or years. Yeah. So I think because of this kind of technology development, we can move our society, our society fast, force fast forward. But how can we keep our basic needs? Uh, that's another issue. Yes, yes. I love um, that way of viewing um, the cultural dissemination of knowledge increasing over time. We also have to take into consideration things like the signal to noise ratio. So how much, you know, now that we have the internet, everyone can publish things to everybody. How much of it is signal and how much of it is noise? And so that's a very, also a very interesting question to ask. And when the printing press first came out, how many of the things that were being printed were signal versus noise? So these are interesting questions. What about the PhD that you did at Caltech? What was that in? What were you studying in your thesis? Uh, I studied biomaterials and then how to design different materials from scratch. So it taught me some principles on materials chemistry and then on how to incorporate the latest knowledge in chemistry, biology, engineering. It's a small place, just like Westlake University, but physics, chemists, and engineers are very close. So it allows exchange of ideas very easily. So you can come up with new ideas in a better way, maybe. Yeah. And then you did the um, postdoc afterward in uh, biomanufacturing at the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at UCLA. So what were you doing in that three-year period? So I designed new uh, biosynthetic pathways to like advanced biofuels or new pharmaceuticals. So it's like a, a beer brewing process. We feed our engineer bugs sugar and then they make whatever you want. Not whatever, something we can do here. Yeah. You can feed sugar as an input. Yes. And you can synthetically engineer. The bugs, the, the, like the E. coli or yeast. You could make E. coli or yeast out the other side. Or sugar I, in? I change the DNA in E. coli or yeast. So they are like is in your beer brewing process. Yes. They become the new chemical plant. So they process the sugar. Sugar goes to the chemicals we want. Oh, okay. So there's yeast or E. coli inside that take sugar as the input and then they turn the output into what do they, what do you want? What, what yes, fuels or chemicals or materials. And which chemicals and materials are you interested in them producing? At the UCI, I make new E. coli that can make uh, advanced biofuels, like not just ethanol. They can make a very long chain alcohols that can 
have much higher energy density or I make some non-natural amino acids they can be the building blocks of uh, some blockbuster drugs Wow you can make E. coli turn sugar into non-natural amino acids Yes Whoa Cool, cool. That you can't find anywhere else in biology? Uh, not very common. Not very Because common. you cannot say, you can never find anything. Yes, yes, the yes, life yes. is different. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, can, yeah, yeah. so maybe you can find this on Mars, you never know. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so non natural amino acids and also the other one was. Advanced biofuels. Advanced biofuels. Okay. So. You said long chain alcohols. alcohols. Okay. And so if you can convert uh, uh, sugar into biofuels and sugar into um, non natural amino acids, did you immediately find applications for those? Did people want to turn the sugar into biofuels right away? Yeah, my. my Post advisor was the leading figure in the biofuel research. He got some medal prize from the president, actually. Whoa. A prize from the. The president of Obama, yeah. From President Obama. Yeah. Wow. For the labs. For the for the labs research. Wow. At UCLA, so. Wow. Incredible. Wow. And then. Um, did, has the technology of um, you know, turning sugar into uh, biofuels or non-natural amino acids, did, has that been implemented into commercial applications? Yeah, there's a company at the US working on that area right now. So. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so it's been a long time for you with uh, working with sugar. We'll talk about this. So you went after the postdoc and took assistant professorship at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science at the University of Minnesota. And ironically enough, we were both from 2010 to 2012 <laughs> there. We might have walked past each other. It's very interesting. Um, and you continued uh, working as you were in the professorship. You continued working with sugar to make different things. You ended up inventing scalable sugar-based biodegradable rubber. And that's important because it can be used as an alternative to petroleum. So teach us about how you ended up inventing this sugar-based biodegradable rubber and why it's important. Uh, actually, uh, Minnesota has one of the best uh, research centers in polymer science. Mm -hmm. So also the chemical engineering uh, is the, almost the best in the country. That's why I chose Minnesota to start my career there. And then there I met Professor uh, Frank Bates and Professor Mark Hume. They work on how to make a PLA another biodegraded polymer uh, like that has different properties. Actually PLA was made is made in is made by NatureWorks, a local company in Minnesota. So they can make PLA. The problem is PLA is very rigid. It's like glass. It, it can easily fall apart if you just throw it. So like several years ago when Sunchip made uh, the potato bags from PLA, they made too much noise just because the property is not good enough. Then they told me this is a big problem how can you make PLA that's flexible enough mm. so it does not make too much noise mm. and you can they do not easily fall apart mm. that could be applied to many more different scenarios in our life so that's a big challenge in the biodegradable industry how to make something that is elastic and flexible so you can make so you can use them for different applications. That's how I came up with this kind of solution to make a new material that is biodegradable, that is biodegradable, that is scalable for commercial production. Yeah. 
and elastic and flexible. Yeah. As well. Okay. Okay, so you were given this challenge and then you figured out how to uh, uh, create this from biomaterials. And so what is this sugar-based biodegradable rubber? How do you input sugar in? Is it similar with the E. coli or yeast again? Yes, we put some DNA. We change the DNA of E. coli. They, you input sugar and then the engineered E. coli will output a new polymer monomer and then we polymerize the monomer and it's super elastic. For example, it can be stretched to 18 times of, of its original length without breaking. Wow. It's yeah. biodegradable, but it's flexible like rubber. Up to 18 times. Flexible like rubber and biodegradable. Yeah. Wow. You can get a yeast, you can genetically engineer a yeast to take sugar in and produce a polymer monomer out the other side. Yes. Who would have, yeah, about <laughs> that, yeah. See, this is also so interesting. It makes me wonder how we can leverage ancient, like E. coli and yeast, ancient biology to engineer these things that are billions of years old that could potentially do new jobs do new jobs more sustainably and for our industrialization sustainably and environmentally friendly you blue beer you don't make pollution yeah that's right yeah. you do not put an explosive bomb somewhere in the city mm -hmm. yeah 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 interesting so maybe the question could be something like uh could we have big bioreactors filled with genetically engineered yeast that is taking lots and lots of sugar in and producing some sustainable biomaterials out the other side and is that process efficient because we have to make sugar we have to grow sugar yes and if we're doing that process unsustainably, then that's not too good. But if we're growing it very sustainably, um, this is through sugar cane, usually. Yes. Is how we're sourcing sugar. Like uh, in Brazil, sugar cane, sugar to ethanol is a sustainable business. It is. Sugar to ethanol. Yeah. For uh, gas for powering. Yeah, in Brazil, uh, the car is run by ethanol. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Or, mm. or blend. Blend with? Or so they do have uh, some cars that are blended. run by pure ethanol, actually. Yeah, by pure, too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're always doing a calculation then on how was the sugar and how was the yeast sourced and produced so that this input side of the production process takes less energy than what you get on the output is a greater amount of energy is a greater amount of value yes. than what you put on the input side so that's this great, also big question that needs to be asked of all these chemical engineers and biomaterials producers is um, make sure that that process, so very similar to things like nuclear fusion is we want to make sure that when we fuse atoms that we're spending much less energy than that we get out. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that's why my experience in Minnesota helps a lot because I taught the intro introduction to chemical engineering. So lesson number one in chemical engineering is you have in, you have out. Your out must be bigger than your in, otherwise forget about it. Yeah, straight up forget about it. If it's not bigger, the out has to be bigger. Bigger in terms of the energy. Economy, energy, environment. Yeah. 
a lot of things to consider. I like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So then, um, where can this specific invention, scalable sugar-based biodegradable rubber, where can these um, stretchable, elastic, um, uh, uh, polymer monomers be used? in the real world applications so for example we can make this kind of phones this yeah and actually we have a new technology right now so we make the phones and then we can crack them and we hit them then we can recycle our monomer back so it's the first kind of the recyclable polymer besides biodegradable that's one possibility or we can make a plastic bags that do not make a noise. They are just like the petrol-based polyethylene bags. The, the same property, but it, our material is biodegradable. Yeah. Or we can make agriculture film for uh, farming. Now the agriculture film is based on polyethylene. It damages our land. The, fertil the fertility drops a lot because of those uh, P particles. So if we, in the future we scale up our production and the farmers use our uh, biodegradable film, then the land can be rescued in the long run. Interesting case. Okay. So already many different applications and okay. This move to Westlake to J July 2019 to the School of Engineering at Westlake, you decided to take on professorship and the principal investigation starting the lab here. So the lab focus on a more sustainable industrialization path new environmentally friendly materials, circular economics, greener chemical production processes. What do you want to, how do you want to achieve that goal? How, why is that goal important and how can we achieve it? I, I can give you one example. So I grew up in Guangxi province. So 20 million people in my province work on sugarcane industry, 20 million people but they only produce around 10 billion US dollars of uh, value per year and it's highly polluted. But there's a company called Appleville in Chicago. I know that the company pretty well. It only has 30,000 people, 30,000 employees. The annual revenue is 30 billion US dollars. So in China, you can see this kind of scenarios everywhere. Many people work on low value industry. In the same time, the industry generates a lot of polluted stuff. So then I realized, maybe I can use my knowledge and creative ideas to help these people. Maybe the value can be increased a little bit. More importantly, I can affect more people, maybe 20 million people instead of 20 or 30,000 people. Yeah. That's a much bigger dream and much bigger need. That's one idea I have. Another idea I have is in China, we were always told by our parents or our professors, you need to do this and do that. But when I moved to the, to the United States, one big lesson I learned is be your own. Only you can make new things because when you create something, it's based on your knowledge, your personality. Everyone is different. But we never had this kind of training in China before. So Westlake can be a new model for this kind of... Uh, you do your own. Be original. Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay, so I really like this paradigm of thinking that 
you know, take on this big, great, grand challenges and you can be the one that tackles a really important industry change that needs to happen and build the new frontier and, and only you can do that. So go and do it. Partner with other people, get their help, go and do it. Be an entrepreneur, be a scientist, push a frontier, be an artist. And be an educator. Be an educator. So then your students can spread your thoughts or they can be, your, they can be the new creators exactly. in the future, yeah. So you push the edge and then you also teach how you've been pushing the edge and teach what you know so other people can go and push it even more creatively with you. And yeah. after you too. Yeah, this teaching aspect is crucial. Okay, let's go to the example you mentioned first. In the Guangxi province, a third of the people, so out of 60 million people, 20 million of them work on sugarcane. And the output of that industry is about 10 billion US dollars per year. Per year for 20 million people. Whereas you gave this example of a company in the United States that has 30,000 people, you could also probably use the same example with Alibaba or Tencent or any of the other software companies in um, China as Still well. Still many more people compared to Amazon or, so, yeah. or Apple. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea is that um, we're talking like 100 billion or more um, per year uh, profit for these companies that is made by an, uh, almost two orders of magnitude less people. So a uh, hundred times less people make 10 times more money, yes. which is very crazy to think about stuff like that. And that Usually, if you have something happening like sugarcane, you are actually teaching me there's actually a waste product that comes from the sugarcane process. And the waste water comes from that process. And that you and your lab can do things like convert that to protein for animal feed. Yes. So in the past, so the factories just dump the water in the river system. And the it has been a big uh, pollution problem for a long, long time. It has never been solved easily. But if we can convert this kind of wastewater into some valuable products such as um, protein, that could increase the value of the whole process. In the same time, because farmers see value from wastewater, they are not going to dump them into the river. Yes they see value and then they will convert that wastewater into animal protein feed. Okay. And how do you guys do the process of converting it into animal feed protein? So there is carbon in the wastewater, like some undigested sugar or some fiber. So we can do some engineering of the box. Then the box can take in the carbon and then they can do some uh, metabolic assimilation, then the carbon will go to protein instead of uh, some algae blooming in the river. Yeah. And then which protein would you want them to make the bugs? So something like a soybean protein because soybean the, protein. the second biggest commodity product that China imports from the United States is soybean. Yeah, Essentially it's the protein soy uh, the protein source in China is soybean. Yes, yeah, soybean for animal for feed. animal feed. Yeah, so for, like for all pig. the all the ducks outside of Beijing. Beijing for the, duck for the Beijing cow. Yeah, pig, pigs. Yeah, the pigs. Yeah, interesting. They're eating soybeans that are being yeah. imported from the U.S. Yeah, and so you can potentially grow the soybeans um, from wastewater. Water, for example, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know what's a good question to ask the 8 billion people on the planet if you take you know, something like the wastewater and if you don't have a, an idea that there's value there, like you were saying, that um, do you think that if you dump the wastewater into the river, do you think this has a downstream effect or no? 
It's a good question to ask people because if people think, no, there's no effect, I can dump whatever I want, then they lack the understanding of the interconnectedness of all nature. So then that would be a good teaching lesson for someone that thinks that if I dump the wastewater, there's no effect. There's a big effect happening. Big. The river can turn black and it can become very smelly. If you visit some big cities in Asia, you, you know that. Yeah. We've had some similar issues in the United States as well. And um, basically developing industrializing countries sometimes uh, didn't proceed with very sustainable methods. Um, Okay, and how would, so this is also another interesting question because a, a lot of people think about um, like if you were to tell me that, oh, Alan, why don't you just uh, keep your, uh, your um, orange peel, right? I have some oranges over there. Why don't you just keep your orange peel on the table and... Um, and I'll, uh, I'll have someone come and uh, pick the, up the compost. Uh, so the convenience thing, right? I can take the wastewater. And how long do I have to wait until you pick it up and convert it into the animal feed? How much money will you give me for the wastewater? Is it worth my time? Yes. These are very important questions, yeah. It's always... For any scientific or engineering projects, you need to know some economics. Yeah, yeah. So what would be the ideal economics, do you think, for something like uh, convincing a farmer uh, that's doing sugarcane production to take the uh, wastewater and... and uh, you uh, give them incentive. What would be the good enough incentive? Uh, the best would be if your technology is good enough. Just you uh, sneak in your current te your developed technology. It can be economically viable already. It's always harder to use to force someone to do something. Would would we if we were smart? maybe we would put the sugarcane development next to the duck or the pig farm. Then in the middle is your wastewater to animal feed protein conversion system. So the sugarcane in the duck or pig farm are kind of next to each other with the middle being the conversion process. That, that would be a perfect scenario, yeah if the land can work for both sugar cane and for pig, and also if, um, if it's down the line, we may figure out methods like clean meat, where we can grow meat in bioreactors from the pig stem cell or the duck stem cell. Actually, artificial meat is a hot topic in US right now. I like love the that. Beyond the Meat Company yeah, or the so good, Impossible yeah. Burger. Yeah. <laughs> but you can buy at grocery stores and restaurants now, which is so exciting. If you haven't yet, go and try it. It's so good. So that's why we hope more and more things can come from biotechnology. Yes. From chemicals, from materials, or maybe even meat. Yes. So it's environmentally friendly. And it consumes less energy, resource. How good can it be, right? Yeah. Especially when you put the, the blindfold on and I give you both duck from the duck as well as duck grown in the bioreactor and you taste it. And then you can't tell the difference when it gets to that level. Plus the bioreactor is much cheaper too. And you don't have to kill the conscious animal. Yes. Big, dip, big thumbs up, huge planetary difference, yeah. Okay, let's go through the, the other examples. So that was the really good example we gave on, um, on um, we talked about polymers uh, at the beginning, that being the third largest manufacturing industry and solutions for that. We talk about 
changing wastewater, converting that into protein for animal feed, that being one of them. Let's talk about the alternative to cyanide. So cyanide's used in the manufacturing process. How can you make an alternative to cyanide? Uh, cyanide has, big, has been a big issue in China as well. If you heard of Tianjin explosion, mm. it happened several years ago in China. So several hundred tons of cyanide just went to the, the environment. That could be detrimental to a lot of stuff. But in the same time, a lot of uh, animal feeds, vitamins, amino acids are manufactured from cyanide. So we, can, we are coming up with new ideas that can use biotechnology, use engineered bugs that can replace the cyanide process. Then in the future, we won't be afraid of a chemical plant near the city. You never know what's going to happen in this kind of chemical plants. They may explode, and then that can be very, very dangerous, just like the Tianjin scenario. What are we using cyanide for right now? Uh, to introduce like some amino group or to activate some uh, carbonyl groups for certain chemicals. Okay. Or to recover gold, actually. Oh, to recover gold. Yeah. Interesting. And then what would you do to produce the alternative to cyanide? Is this again sugar in and then... Sugar in, target out. Yeah, no cyanide in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And you have to figure out how to genetically engineer either yeast or E. coli to take sugar and make an alternative to cyanide. Yes. Okay. That's one of the things the lab's focused on too. Yes. Okay, okay. Let's talk about also the alternative to Roundup. So right now we're spraying Roundup on weeds. We have, we, we spray lots of herbicides, pesticides on our growing food. And we don't know how it affects us down the stream when we eat the food. And also how the, the crops build resilience over time. So what do you think is a similar process again where you take in sugar into genetically engineered yeast or e coli and they produce an alternative to roundup oh that's one possibility okay so there are two possible directions maybe we can make some natural herbicides they are from some weird organisms but if we can somehow uh, manipulate the cells the engineer cells they can make this natural herbicides much more efficiently and they they derive from nature they can be biodegradable then you can solve the roundup issue that's one direction another direction is currently maybe there are, are good replacements of roundup uh, glyphosate already but they are very expensive so if i can combine uh, biotechnology and green chemistry to make this kind of roundup replacements more environmentally friendly and as cheap as glyphosate, then the farmers can rotate to use different herbicides. Then the drug resistance won't be a big issue. I think this is a global challenge. Global challenge. It happens in China. It happens in India. It happens in the United States. We we need to find a solution to this big problem and i believe we we will be able to to do it yes how does you and your lab figure out how to genetically engineer the yeast or the e coli to be able to find these alternatives to cyanide alternative to roundup what do you do to say okay if we engineer it this way, maybe it'll produce this alternative. Uh, that's a good question and tough question 
many people ask me this question. At the, this moment, I can only tell them it's not easy. You, I have so many. I had so many sleepless nights just to think about stuff, and because I got a training in chemistry, I got a training in biology, like all these possible organic reactions, all these possible uh, metabolic reactions in a cell are in my brain. Even so, I need to wow. uh, try to combine this and that. So that's not easy right now, but I believe since artificial intelligence, big data are uh, moving on fast. Yes. So maybe in the future I can work with the computer scientists to yes. design some uh, new process just in the computer first. Then we can, yes. like, and now computer is better than at playing chess. Yes. And go. And goes. Yeah. But in the future they can they can design some new stuff for us as well. I love the biosimulation space. Yes. So instead of it all having to be in your head and you only be, you know, you have to sleep eight hours a day, you have to, uh, you have less processing ability of all of the permutations, the combinations. And so you can leverage the artificial intelligence, big data, and you can potentially run a bunch of different genetically engineered yeast and E. coli um, and simulate out if they produce good alternatives to cyanide and Roundup. Yes. So in at this stage, I can we can only pick some uh, possible targets, but in the future, this can be this can be much much bigger. Yeah. And then our world can be much much better. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's do um, other examples as well. So we have something that's also pretty um, popular is, and we see this quite often. I mean, in the United States, when you were there, we were talking about this before we started, that so many people have their own personal clothes dryer in their homes and um, when I was visiting Armenia two years ago in Yerevan actually reminds me a little bit of China in some ways very you know older places in the world and it's true that in China too just like in Yerevan that in the summer you hang the clothes outside to get dried by the natural sun instead of using the dryer and you you told me you said well, Alan, if we could design a clothes dryer that would use even one third of the less energy to dry the clothes, think about all of the people in the world using that process instead in the same amount of time, but one third the amount of energy needing to be used to dry the clothes. Wow. That would be very powerful. So there's all of these different options for building the more sustainable industrialization. Yes. So actually, your problem is beyond my knowledge. I am only good at chemistry and biology, but that could be a physics problem. Yeah. How to, like in the past 100 years, physics provided nuclear energy. It helps us a lot. But how, we, how can we combine all these kind of physics laws to make our world better. That could be more challenges as well. So you, this is almost a call to action then that if we can use physics to find quantum mechanics, which then gives us smartphones, computers, GPS, MRI, etc. We can use physics to make our drying machines a third more efficient which would make our sustainable economies of the world better i like that i like that so you're it's almost a call to action to physics and math and biology and chemistry and a lot of the sciences to say 
identify especially things like the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations and find the ways that you can incrementally make a process, can these computers have even more computational capacity and even less of the resources that we need to mine from the planet? Yes. So it's questions like that. Can we grow the clean meat in the bioreactor instead of slaughtering the animals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, I like this, this, this idea, this, these ways of perceiving the world is very good, is very important. We also talked about this one before we started too, this idea that if Alibaba and Amazon are shipping billions of packages every single year to people and that number is only increasing and how can we do something like make a material or a, or a, even just a shipping strategy that is maybe doesn't require the packaging materials or very sustainable biodegradable packaging materials. Yeah, this challenge can be solved by uh, two different directions. It can be a smart shipping. So maybe you have uh, some glass container or maybe metal container ship the stuff and then you collect them to do reshipping again. Yes. That's one possible solution. Yes. Another possible solution is maybe I can use my past knowledge in material design to make some cheaper and biodegradable or recyclable materials that, that's used for shipping. Yeah, yeah. Is graphene the lightest and strongest right now? Uh, actually, I do not know the answer. Okay, I think graphene, and I don't know where that is with carbon fiber, but um, because graphene can be, you can imagine like a little graphene box on the drone, and then you open the graphene box, take the object from inside, and then close it, and the drone takes the graphene box back. If the, if the if the drone does not use too much energy, that's possible. <laughs> if the drone uses nuclear fusion for energy. I, I just, I love that idea. I really want that to happen as soon as possible. It'd be great if Westlake um, pushed further into um, fusion as a source of sustainable energy. I'm not sure where they're at with that right now, but I, that would be a really good, uh, also part of the multidisciplinary push here. Let's talk about um, forced regulation. So this subject is very interesting. Like, how do we advance people to make more sustainable paths to industrialization fastest? And a good question is if a state or a province or a country or whatever bans the use of something like a plastic bag or a plastic straw or whatever it is. Does it then force entrepreneurs and people to innovate and make a more sustainable path faster? Um, or is the too much governmental control over um, the economic market forces sometimes not so good. What do, you, what do you think about that? It's always a balance. So sometimes if you, you close certain industry, then um, it can affect the people's life. For example, the pork price in China has increased from 15 yen to 25 yen in just one year. For? For half a, half a kilogram. Of? Pork, pork meat. P uh, pork meat? Pork meat, yeah. 15 to, to 25. 25 yuan? Yeah. For half a kilogram? Half a kilogram. Of pork meat? Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. in one year. In one year, wow. Because the government shuts down a, a lot of uh, small uh, farming places. So, so less people uh, raise uh, pigs. Oh, is it because... Some environmental pollution, one, one issue, another issue is like the 
the rising price of uh, soybean protein, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was it were were those smaller farms not doing the clean practice for growing the yes? Pigs? But in the same time, it's so if you have, it's for the health of the people. It's yeah. for the health of the people. In the same time, if you can develop new technologies, new technologies that can replace this kind of environmentally friendly processes, is win-win for all different parties involved. Yeah, correct. Yeah, like could maybe an incentive. From the government, like a big prize, or from a private institution, let's say, like the X Prize Foundation or whatever, maybe they could say, "Hey, uh, instead of putting a regulation on um, plastic bags or plastic straws or or how we grow uh, raise animals, why don't we make a prize from the government or from private industry that says?" How do you solve the plastic bag issue? How do you solve the plastic straw issue? How do you solve the slaughtering of animals issue? And then give them, you know, a million dollar prize and have a crowdsourcing of ideas for the solutions to the plastic straws, the plastic bags, the slaughtering of animals, and then fund the best one and keep it building for five, ten years, and boom, you have the solution. The prize model is very interesting. Economic incentive is always the best incentive.、Mm -hmm. Yeah. Economic incentives towards sustainable industrialization. I like、yes. that. Maybe there can be a sustainable industrialization prizes awarded more often. I like that idea. Even even for the cyanide stuff, we talk about Europe and China. Banned the expansion of a cyanide、uh, plants.、Okay. So nowadays, if a company wants to make new, a、uh, more、uh, cyanide derived chemicals, they have to do it somewhere, maybe in South Southeast Asia, or maybe somewhere else.、Mm -hmm. China and Europe banned the further development of cyanide plants. Yes. Interesting. Let's have us also. Get deeper into、um, circular economics. We've been talking about this throughout, but it's eliminating waste and the continual use of resources from the system. So, what would these advancements mean for our world as we see Africa and Asia, Latin America, all these other places in the world that are industrializing so fast that how can There be sustainable industrialization processes. What is that circular economics that you envision? So we, like in the introduction to chemical engineering, I taught out must be bigger than one. If you do not have a balance, you accumulate something in the middle. So, for example, we in the Past three hundred years for industrialization, we have accumulated a lot of plastic microparticles in the ocean in our drinking water. We accumulate a lot of、uh, CO two in the atmosphere,、yes. so it generates greenhouse effect. Our glacier is melting, and、uh, we. See a lot of that fishes everywhere. So this the acidification of our oceans. Yeah, yeah. So this kind of circular economy is very、uh, important for our economy, our world, and our future generations. Otherwise, we don't even have a clean place to put our feet on in the future. So, this also kind of takes us back to that example of when you're, you know, when you're pouring this wastewater into the river, you have to realize that the interconnectedness of everything. If we are slowly adding more and more CO two parts per million into the atmosphere, creating a greenhouse effect, melting some of the glaciers, not only on land but also in the water, 
the land ones causing the sea levels to slowly rise, the oceans being acidified, the coral reefs being bleached, these types of things that are happening are, in a sense, it's us needing to awaken to the interconnectedness of everything. We can't just do one thing and expect it to be in a vacuum. It immediately starts affecting and butterfly effects happen for the rest of nature. And so to us, it's a wake up call. Hey, humans, remember everything's connected. You can't just do one thing. The earth will show you a wake up call like the parts per million CO2 rising and these are wake up calls for humans. And for us as a scientist, we need to de develop new technologies that can meet this kind of new needs. Yeah. And more labs to pop up where young people are pressing the frontiers of developing those new technologies and having those be well funded. Like Westlake having a both private public funding vehicle is very useful to building a world class research center. And I think having that strategy more prevalent around our world with institutions being funded like that for scientific research, for building these tools for these sustainable development goals and all these types of things are crucial, are crucial. Like you mentioned artificial intelligence and big data being applied so you can run biosimulation so you can most quickly find the alternatives to cyanide and Roundup fastest. Yes. And if we don't have those computational resources, it's going to take us longer. And so how do we fund for those computational resources most effectively? So, so important. Let's do a couple of the questions that we like asking on our way out. So how can we inspire more people around our world to work together? Uh, open. Be open and exchange ideas. Yes. Yes, short and sweet. I like that. Uh, there's an, an unhealthy change in, around the world right now. So we, many countries become more closed. Yeah. more open and more sharing of the ideas in collaborative ways. Yeah. And especially on those uh, great challenges facing every person on Earth. Yes. This so is the, the, the butterfly in Amazon can, can cause hurricane in, the, in, the, in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe a hurricane in no, the, no, in the Miami, Florida. Florida. Yeah, Florida. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's tornado. Maybe a tornado in Dakota. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah in Dakota. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, in a sense, it would be that all of these advancements that we're making towards the sustainable development goals could be open notebook science. So, it could be that if you make a significant advancement, you can make it open notebook for non-commercial use. So people from all different countries in the world that are scientific researchers could take and like use your genetically engineered yeast to continue. That could be one possibility. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. What about, what do you think is a skill that young people should know as we go into the exponential technology age? You need to have some basic training in chemistry, biology, and engineering for sure. Mm. Especially in my uh, research direction. And I think in this modern age, you do not need to remember so many things you always have a computer that you can you have you can use google google can tell you everything baidu yeah. baidu so you search you can find the knowledge i think in this modern age the most important thing is 
how can you combine all different knowledge to come up with new solutions, new devices, new thoughts that a computer cannot do, that anyone else cannot do. It's called personality. You should be your own. And your own may be able to change the world, nothing else. Mm. Ah, that answer landed so well with me, yes. How can you find the novel pieces of knowledge, combine them into something that a computer or that other humans can't do, that only you can do? What is your unique gift that you can bring the world? Yes, that's something uh, Chinese education system does not put too much em uh, focus on in the past. Our Westlake Un University can be a new model. Yes. And I went to United States for education for my PhD for postdoc and then for my starting career. And this kind of personality training is big for me, I, I think. I, I learned how to be my own. Yes. How to have my own solution. Yes. Yes. In a sense, it's like the US has SAT, ACT, China has Gaokao, and we have these funnels of young people that we think is most optimal and it's good in some ways but what about the social skills what about the emotional intelligence and the sustainable development goals and project-based learning and finding your unique gifts and finding those pieces of knowledge and combining them in ways other people can't and computers can't being an individual but also being a node in the collective and knowing how to do those things effectively Otherwise, you, you will be a machine, and then you are not that valuable in a society. Yeah. More, you, are, you are still valuable, but it's not optimal, yeah. More replaceable, maybe. Yes. Yeah. And it's, you want to be irreplaceable in the world. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I like that. What would you say is the meaning of life, of this big human experiment? What's the point of it? love, help, and fulfill. What do you think is the role of love? From my own, from my own experience, we need to love the planet, planet just like we love our family. I love that quote. We need to love our planet like we love our family. It also brings lots of warmth. <laughs> I love that one. And then what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Nature. 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 Even I do science. I still think uh, science should serve nature. Yes. We all come from nature. We all breathe the air, drink the water, eat the food. And when we lose a connection to that source of sustainability for us, what sustains us, we have many problems that evolve in the world so the more we can realize our inter Green. our interconnectedness yeah. with these little guys yeah the more we can live harmoniously peacefully sustainably yeah Ketchin thanks so much for coming on the yeah. show this has been a huge pleasure thank you
Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. And incredible work you've been doing here um, over your years, and um, we look forward to the advancements of your lab in the future. Thank you for your great work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about sustainable industrialization, about circular economics about all the other topics we talked about in the show, about a more sustainable industrialization path for Asia, for Africa, for Latin America, for all these developing countries around the world, for greener chemical production processes of things like cyanide, of Roundup, of how to leverage biological tools like genetic engineering of yeast and E. coli and feeding them sugar, all these really cool and interesting things about how you can dry clothes more effectively, launching physics to help with the sustainable challenges, making more sustainable polymers, making more sustainable delivering of packages, about how we can figure out how to best incentivize these sustainable industrialized paths. Check out the links in the bio to Ketchin's work. You can find the link to his Westlake profile as well as more links in the bio below. Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support Simulation. Our links are below. You can find us on PayPal, PayPal Patreon, Cryptocurrency. You can design cool merch and get paid. And also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Good job. Yeah. Good job. Good job.